It's been two and a half years since someone else has had an event. Wow. Harwood. Wow. We have some very special guests this evening to celebrate our inaugural Back in the Harwood night. So that's fabulous. I'm good? Okay. So now I can be more formal. My name is Jan Smith, and I'm sure many of you know me. Um, I have a few announcements. <clears throat> Number one, welcome to the sixth annual Taos Writers Conference. Uh, number two, I have some thank yous. Uh, my biggest thank you goes to our keynote speaker, Ana Castillo, who spent the day, and I mean the entire day, driving all the way up to Taos. So I'm so excited and thrilled that you took the time to do that, to be with us tonight. Thank you, Anna. Uh, who is, oh, let me see, I have it written down in my notes, but I'm on the wrong page. Uh, oh, yes, he is the Associate Dean of Graduate Studies at UNM, and he is going to be introducing Anna after I give a few remarks. I also want to thank our sponsors who are helping us with putting on the Taos Writers Conference. That includes the Taos News, the Taos Community Foundation, uh, Lambert's Restaurant, um, and several individuals, including Holly and Tom Lazari, Catherine Strisick, Adam McCracken, Lucy and Dirk Herman, and Bob and Sharon Barton. Uh, like I said, we'll be doing the video because I have a few people that are not able to come to the talk tonight, so I'll be sending them the link. Will not be on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Just be those so those individuals. And then I also want to give a big round of thanks to Rick Smith from Brodsky Books. He is the uh, go-to guy for all of Anna's books, and she also brought some books up as well. And um, Rick is graciously going to give me extra copies of anything that doesn't sell out. So we'll have them at the book sale table at Somos um, during, for the rest of the weekend. So you can take a look, and if you want to buy, you can buy them there as well. Um, you all got this survey form. I know that they are tedious, um, but I would really appreciate it if you take a minute to fill them out. They are for grant purposes, and you can just, there's a little box on the way out. You can just drop it in there on your way out. Thank you so much. Then uh, I have an announcement to make about a new um, scholarship fund that Somos is starting. Uh, it's called uh, the Phyllis Potch Scholarship Fund. As many of you know, uh, she passed this past fall. And um, we are starting a scholarship fund. And if you feel, I'm going to read you just a little bit about Phyllis for those of you who may not know her or knew her during when she was with us. Um, she passed away on October 21st at the age of 93. She was a teacher, a poet, a fierce advocate for the written and spoken word. The daughter of Jewish socialists, Phyllis believed in the literary arts as a critical tool for social justice. She served on the board of Samos for 22 years and as president for 14 of those years, during which she launched the Young Writers Program and many other initiatives. She worked to bring pen to New Mexico and facilitated the readings of imprisoned and censored writers from across the globe, including you, Sam Orr. In addition, she coordinated events in support of endangered and disappeared writers in Latin America, weekly readings of poets for murdered Poets for Peace in the Months Before the Iraq Invasion, and two programs to bring attention to the murdered women of Juarez. She coordinated four nature writing conferences. The first keynote speaker was Terry Temptis Williams, and a women's writers conference, The Right to Write. Uh, SOMAS has always endeavored to make low cost and free programs support the public when we're able to 
Phyllis Hodge Scholarship Fund will provide needed support to SOMOS, continue these efforts by providing scholarships to those who would not ordinarily be able to attend our programs. And they will be made available for all SOMOS sponsored programs, like the Writers' Conference, for example, and for all ages from 10 through 99. Um, we're hoping that the fund gives us a tangible way to remember our friend Phyllis and the literary legacy that she left us. We invite you to talk to either myself or to our development coordinator, who's waving her hand, Ariana Kramer, uh, if you'd like to know more about the scholarship fund and how you may contribute. We also um, were bequeathed a large uh, collection of her poetry books. And she, her daughter decided Actually, really, Phyllis had decided before she died that any book that she gave to Somos, that Somos would keep the proceeds of. But now what we're doing is that any book that sells of Phyllis's, we're adding to the scholarship fund so that people can utilize that. So with that, uh, I believe that I am now complete, and I invite Jesse Elman to come up front. Jan. Um, as, as Jan mentioned, I'm Dr. Jesse Aleman. I am a professor of English by training and trade at the University of New Mexico. Been there for two decades, and I'm now doing a little bit of time as the Associate Dean of Graduate Studies. Um, it is, however, my distinct pleasure um, and considerable honor to introduce tonight's guest. Um, I was going to keep this short, but any of you who know uh, Dr. Ana Castillo's work knows that this cannot be done um, in a pithy manner. <laughs> Sometime between 1973 and 1975, Ana Castillo sat down and said to herself, I'm going to be a poet. By 1977, she released her first chapbook in her hometown of Chicago, two years after graduating with her BA in art from Northwestern Illinois University. Alternativa Publications printed 200 copies of the modest 32-page Otro Canto, and then immediately went out of business, <laughs> leaving hot off the press copies of Castillo's poetry to loiter around Chicago's west side. So back then, Castillo's first publication didn't necessarily make the same impact on Chicano literature as the contemporaneous books we now call um, classics. Tomas Rivera's Inocio de Caragol la Tierra, Rudolfo Naya's Bless Me Ultima, Rolando Quinojosa's El Valle, or Aristeo Brito's um, El Diablo de Texas. All of these and many others by men of the time labored to describe, define, debate, and imagine Chicano literature as it emerged across Texas, New Mexico, and California. But Castillo's Otro Canto sang an entirely different tune from the Midwest. Modest as it might have been, Otro Canto announced in voz alto, as it were, Castillo's place in the boom of Chicana literature. And since 1977, she has been at ground zero of literature by Chicana Caministas. Her career as a writer, with its start from a relatively unknown Chicago press, entails the story of contemporary Chicana literature in general, as Castillo's innovation, productivity, and critical voice and unwavering feminism are all indicative of the way Chicana literature here with an X um, originated on the margins of mainstream American and Chicano-centered cultural production. Not long after Otro Canto, Castillo released The Invitation after getting her master's degree from the University of Chicago. Published by Third Woman Press in 1979, the poems highlight the voices of women who reclaim sexuality as a personal form of political engagement that rejects racism from outside the Chicano community and sexism from within it. Her third collection, aptly titled um, um, The 1984 Women Are Not Roses, marks the confluence between her poetic voice and Chicano publication history. The collection gives the clearest and most creatively incisive vision of Chicano feminist sentiment that Castillo had been cultivating since Otro Canto. And its publication with Arte Publico Press, by then the most important venue for our literature, announced Castillo's place within the Chicano and Chicana, and now we would call the Chicanx literary renaissance. 
just as it was enjoying larger circulation, readership, classroom use, and scholarship. By 1984, Chicana Lit had become legit, and alongside it, Castillo's work <laughs> flourished. By 1995, she published My Father Was a Toltec, a selection of poetry um, from her first three chapbooks with New York's publishing giant, Norton Company. And by 2000, she released another collection, I Asked the Impossible, with New York's other powerhouse, Anchor Books, a small cry from the small press on Chicago's west side. While poetry inaugurated her career, however, I would say that it's her poetic daring that has allowed her, her writing to flourish into different genres, experimental modes, and mixed mediums. Her novels ate to date with another, Isabel 2021, slated for 2025, um, no, excuse me, Isabel 2121, so it's set in the future, slated for 2025. All experiment with form and content um, to express the complexity of women's voices, lived experiences, and conflicted loyalties. And as with her poetry, the trajectory of her fiction charts the story of her publication success. Released by Bilingual Press in 1986, her award-winning first novel, The Mishiwala Letters, is a brilliant collection of personal letters that could be read in different sequence or as standalone vignettes for alternative readings to Teresa and Alicia's adventures in Mexico. While her 2015 novel, Give It To Me, published by New York's Feminist Press, recounts the biting humor, the life of Palma, a 40-something-year-old divorcee whose attraction to her younger cousin unfolds the complexity of family histories and sexual identities. Give It To Me, for which she garnered the Lambda Award, captures perfectly Castillo's irony, wit, satire, seriousness, and sexual politics with, with keen subtlety that can only really truly be grasped after getting to know her voice across her 1990 novel, Sapagonia, an anti-romance in three-eighths meter, as she calls it, the hilarious telenovela-like novel So Far From God, published by New York's Norton, Doubleday's 1999 Pill My Love Like an Onion, followed by Curbstone Press's Watercolor Woman, Opaque Men, and The Guardians in, 20, um, in 2007. Combined, her poetry and fiction demonstrate her knack, <clears throat> excuse me, for experimenting with form, style, genre, technique, all to convey human emotion, ideas, and political positions with creative finesse. So it's not surprising that she's also the author of a celebrated collection of essays, Massacre of the Dreamers, um, which was written as her dissertation for her PhD in American Studies, earned from the University of Bremen in 1991. The essays take up the complexity of Chicana identity, racism, labor oppression, and sexual politics that play out in life, literature, and social activism. But the book also offers a vision of healing to counterbalance the weight of multiple oppressions. It's a book of hope, despite its seeming bleak title. It is, in fact, daunting to cover the depth and scope of Dr. Castillo's career. And I'm sure I've missed a few titles, including her short story collection, Lover Boy, her edited book on the Virgin of Guadalupe, her translation of This Bridge Called My Back, and her recent work on flash fiction and her e-zine blog, La Tolteca. And then sitting here talking to her, she just wrote another collection of short stories that's apparently coming out. So this is a real problem here, as you can tell. <clears throat> But two recent publications, now apparently three, but two recent publications shore up why Dr. Castillo continues to hone her craft, to open her heart to heal, and to sharpen even the most prosaic words into daggers. Black Dove, Mama Mi Home Me, out of Feminist Press, is a moving and at times harrowing memoir of motherhood, with recollections of Dr. Castillo's mother, juxtaposed alongside her own experiences as a single mother raising her son in a world of street racism that often ends in incarceration. The collection of personal essays is as painful as it is poignant about the intersectional struggles that cross and continue across generations. Meanwhile, her recent book, My Book of the Dead, a collection of new poems published in 2021 by UNM Press, takes aim at surviving the Trump presidency, the COVID crisis, environmental disaster, and the onslaught of political, racial, and health pandemics that continue to beset us. 
It's also a collection that puts Dr. Castillo's first two loves back together in a bed of paper. The collection includes her original illustrations. It's worth knowing that before her poetry, before her prose, before her plays even, and I think I forgot to mention she has written plays, <laughs> before her writing, so to speak, Anna's first love, as she once put it in a 1990 interview, was visual art. Some of us shouldn't be surprised in this. She holds a degree in it from Northwestern University, after all. She recounts painting around the blood splotches of the butcher paper her mother brought home. Or upcycling, as we now call it, upcycling junk mail into drawing paper. At some point in her career, visual art gave way to the written word. I don't know when and I don't know why. I couldn't divine that out of the interviews she gave, but that is something that she has mentioned as part of her development as a writer. With my book of the dead, she's resurrected one to give life to the other. All of which show up why Dr. Castillo is such a distinguished guest tonight. She holds an honorary doctorate from Colby College and is the recipient of the American Book Award from Before Columbus Foundation, the Carl Sandburg Award, and the Mountains and Plains Booksellers Award. She has garnered fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts in Fiction and Poetry, was bestowed the Sor Juana Achievement Award by Chicago's Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum, and was awarded the American Studies Association's Gloria Anzaldúa Prize to an independent scholar. She's held the Lund Gill Endowed Chair at Dominican University in Illinois. Um, we wreaked havoc for a couple of years as colleagues as summer faculty at the prestigious Breadloaf School of English. Um, they didn't invite us back. Um, <laughs> And in 2020, she was named Northeastern's University Distinguished Alumni, the highest recognition the university bestows to an alumni. She's also been recently bestowed with three different Lifetime Achievement Awards, the Penn Oakland Reginald Lockett <coughs> Lifetime Award, the Lifetime Achievement Award in Literature by Latina 50 Plus, and in March 2021, she was inducted into Chicago's Literary Hall of Fame as a recipient of the Fuller Award for Lifetime Achievement. But knowing Dr. Castillo, her work, and her tendency for saucy, salacious, and scandalous characters, I suspect she might hold as her greatest accolade the fact that Arizona's Tucson Unified School District banned her books. <laughs> <laughs> Their loss is our gain. For it's my honor and privilege to give to you tonight one of the most prolific, influential, and incisive writers of our day. Chicana feminist poet, thinker, scholar, activist, teacher, philosopher, and healer, the brilliant Dr. Anna Kessinger. Yes. and your, and uh, being there with me, I, it, uh, it, it, it seems sometimes you hear things that in this world and in this country, they tell you, well, if you go to school, if you can be anything, you can get anywhere, it'll all just happen. And many of us who have and who continue to go and we realize that the, the struggles are real and, and we continue even much later and even when we're on the other side of the desk. And so this is true. We did, we wreaked a, we wreaked a little havoc and uh, they did send us away and said goodbye. So we go and wreak havoc elsewhere. So, so we've been thrown out of better places than this. So, so anyway, so that's how we felt about that. We're faculty of color. So anyway. Um, I want to thank Jan for working with me for the invitation, and thank you very much for having my books here. And to all of you, I'm wishing ahead of time who are here for this writers' conference a very, very uh, fruitful time. Uh, the last few years, and I, I feel that I think probably everybody in the world, in the history of the world, in every nation, every country, and every village, probably they all always feel that they have been born in the most tumultuous times of history, and, and, and maybe they have. 
And, and if you weren't born in those tumultuous times, at some point you experience them. And so um, I do feel that our younger generations are experiencing things maybe much worse than we did, but we're living here to experience some of the things that, speaking for myself, I had, I had anticipated and I had always wished would not come to be. So in the fall of in November, precisely of 2016, I was living in my little, my little homestead in La Union, New Mexico, where I was living alone, and a friend had bought me a TV set to watch the election, so I had a TV set. But as the evening grew long, I couldn't take it anymore, and I went to sleep in uh, 2016, and I woke up around 11 o'clock, and I was in 1933. <laughs> hmm. uh, after my shock, and everybody was shocked on every, every side of the spectrum, I and accepted the reality, I began to go into a, a depression. Because as I said, you always think this could happen. As Sinclair Lewis says, it can't happen here. You think it's, but it won't happen here, but it will happen here, and it, and it was gonna happen here. And I, so somewhere in 2017, I decided that 40 or 50 years of, of activism and speaking personally for myself and writing had all been for naught. This is how you feel when you're depressed. You feel like I, I'm gonna give up. So I declared and said I was not gonna write anymore. I stopped writing, and that's where the drawings came back, and I started write, drawing every day and drawing every day, and I'm still drawing, I can't stop now, <laughs> I just keep drawing. But around 2018, I began to get my bearings again, and I thought, well, I've come too far to turn back now. And so I began to think, well, what can I write about? Well, you can only write about your truth. You can only write about what you can write about. You can only write about what you know, what you feel. When I was giving memoir writing workshops, I would say that the approach to a memoir is there's a conundrum in your heart. It could be a family conundrum, it could be a personal history one, it could be one of your country, your nation, your village, your family. And you have to figure it out. There's a question in your mind, and the quest is the memoir. And you proceed to search for the answer. At the end of the writing, you may not have the answer to that mystery, but you have discovered so many other things. You're opening up other mystery boxes, and that's how you develop your memoir. So I wonder, where do I, how do I get back into this writing? It's just what I do. I'm like mid, mid, midstream. What do I do? And I remember that I had started to write poetry in 2012, and I had decided I was going to work on a new collection of poems. And I don't know, we tell ourselves, we have little stories, little narratives in our heads about things we're going to write. And th my narrative was it was going to take 10 years. I don't know, it just got in my head that a book of poems, a solid book of poems, will take 10 years. No matter how many poems you write, you're gonna get rid of a lot of them and you'll just have the good ones and then there'll be a book of poems and it'll be 10 years. But anyway, so that was 2012. So I had a few poems, it's 2018, and I did start to put these poems together. So I was writing what I knew, writing what I was feeling. And this is what we also do as memoir writers, as fiction writers, as nonfiction writers, as essayists, as journalists. We are witnesses to our times. And I chose poetry and poetry brought me back word by word. And so I'd like to share a little bit of that. The book is called My Book of the Dead. I shared it when I finished it. I submitted it to the University of New Mexico Press, and they were gracious enough to accept it and, and publish it. And I'd like to start with a poem um, that was inspired by a summer that I spent with two writers. Um, Two bad boys. No, not you and Jane. <laughs> two other ones. Two other bad boys. Um, I have a mark. I have a mark here. Uh, the whole summer, Roberto and Chuck. It's called Two Men and Me. It's 
for all the writers. I left Bukowski again, went back to Bolaño. Both men bad to their women. Me, like the rest, couldn't get enough. Both smoked and drank themselves to death. They liked it rough. Said that was how they got their best writing done. One winter, we all ended up in hell. Ran into each other at a cafe. Revision, bar, public bath, fill in the blank. Chuck wanted to fuck. Roberto punched him in the gut. We quaffed a few whiskeys. They knew, I knew. I wasn't that kind of gal. Instead, we set out to do a three-way poem. Tu primero, said Bolaño. What, Yukowski said, no comprendo. <laughs> How fucked up you gotta be, you can't understand Spanish, even in hell. Roberto was bad. <laughs> you illegals, the others started racializing the situation. No wonder he was in hell. Then again, we all were. I'm not Mexican, pinche gringo, Roberto yelled, throwing another swing. This time he got me in the eye by mistake. There are no mistakes in hell, the bartender said, handing me some ice. That's the beauty of this place. The guy stopped. No one had ever seen ice in hell. <laughs> yeah, it was the start of something big. <laughs> So in 2015, I, I wrote this in my, my little hamster in La Union on, in memory of John Trudell, written upon the occasion of his crossing over. It's called A Storm Upon Us. A storm is coming. It is on the horizon. It has traveled far, fast, wide, and taken much in tow, the storm. Infused with lies and nitrogen, water, air, ground infused, our fruit and animals infused, our minds infused with lies and nitrogen. We're dumbstruck, believe ourselves smart when we are instead confused. The tricksters counted on our being caught unawares. They knew our selfishness, greed, most of all, fears. The storm approaches. Can you hear it? 999 hoof-like vibrations beat against our eardrums and we remain indifferent. We have our things gathered. Our children seem fine. We always rebound. The storm comes and goes, returns, next time harder. We don't even bother with shelters, give it new names each time, further fire and rain, we mourn. We start again. It could have been you or me, we say, dying in public beneath a baton's blows, falling amid the spray of a sniper's bullets, but it wasn't. We go on. Disaster has happened to someone else. We venture out and buy more, we take more, we discard, we pillage the earth. The storms take sinister forms, go by isms, neo and post hyphenations. Be afraid, leaders of the faceless enemy worn. Beware, be aware. When you travel, we cannot protect you. We will be vigilant of your whereabouts. Our watchful eye will know your life, long lines to survive, much less thrive, lie before you. You'll feel shame, like in naked dreams, but worse because we, in fact, are watching you. We will make sure you don't question. And when the storm is upon you, 
when it has destroyed your homes and your children are not fine and your dreams of golden roses and bright days are nowhere but in the pages of a storybook, we will be content in our heavens, eating peeled grapes, zipping fine wines from our vineyards of abundance, sitting on our thrones. New gods will smile down upon you, our creation of ruin. Pick our teeth with your bones. So that was 2015, so you kind of see like, you know, the poet, think about poetry, you ask yourself, like, what good is poetry? What good does it do to write poetry? Well, for one thing, I realized that there are many more poets than there are people who read poetry, so we don't even read each other's poetry, we're just reading our poetry to other people. So, but poets, if I may say so, are and have been historically, you may say, a form of visionary, a form of a prophet. It's the reason why, when there is a revolution, and if there will be a revolution, you can better best believe, if you are a poet, we are the first that are taken off and put against the wall. Because you said it, and you probably wrote it somewhere. I get a lot of questions uh, when I go and give readings from different genres and so on. There's always, when you do a Q&A, invariably, and if you have this question, I have the answer for you already. <laughs> what is your writing process? This is my writing process. Here's a secret. With mop in one hand, cocktail in the other, <laughs> at 9 a.m. or night, Flies swatted, roach corpses swept, Lola Beltran belts mi ranchito through house speakers from room to room, I sing off key. Mares fed, dogs let out, sun beating on the flat roof, moon rising behind the cloud, verses take form. When snow turns to winter and it is when snow turns to rain and it is still winter. I am a Bedouin woman. Burka weighs and drags. Gold sprays lazily along red stone. My gaze afar. He was a cheerful boy. My son, the poet. Grew tall like the poplar with eyes fiery as embers. My son. I mutter, as if he just left the room, sense of his soul lingering, my son. I start each conversation as though my heart were whole as a pomegranate clinging to a branch alive. My son writes verses and lives like a monk among hyenas. He prays, meditates, Say it, my son, locked behind walls. I once climbed the jagged hills of Petra, hid within its caves. My son sleeps on a pissed-stained bunk, once a boy who had warm bed, milk, the breast of his mother upon which to rest his head. He read books and played with other children. On the phone now, Men are loud and he shouts, Ma, my son, each bead I pray upon at dawn has his name. My lips murmur, God in your heaven, the chittering of birds, the desert floor, all the same. Why does the world not long for him as I? God made us strong this thing called mother. The rain and torrents are Mary's tears that cleanse the weary. My son, my eyes will soon be illuminated with your presence. I want to, I have several poems in this collection that were written for um, 
for other poets as John Trudell, and I discovered a, a woman poet, and I, with, with deep regret, I never had the opportunity to meet her while she was alive, and I don't know how we didn't run into each other. It's a very small world, this world of poets, and gets smaller when it's people of color, and it's smaller when it's women of color, and it's smaller when it's queers of color, and it's smaller when you're an academic and a poet, and it's smaller when you're a single mom, and it's smaller when you're a single mom with a baby boy. And her name was Akila Oliver, and I heard about her on social media when she just died. She was in her 40s, and I thought, how did I not meet her? How did I not know her? And I ordered her book, and I ordered a book, a copy of it, for my son, and this is a poem called Homage to Aquila, and it's for Aquila Oliver and her son Onuchi in memoriam. His body was decomposing, her baby, her flesh, child she once held at her breast, he was dead. Death took residence. Neglect, negligence, negligence, hospital sued over a young man left in an emergency room. Mine was incarcerated. How was it all became a crapshoot? Fate of offspring we'd nourished, adored, gave to our last breath. They are babies, girls, boys. Muchachitos, niños queridos, neighborhood kids, pudgy or puny, and picked on or had too many deals. Los Garcia or the walkers. Mom had lupus or marido with bad back and couldn't work. Nephews, nieces, mijos, mijas, nietos, nietos, sent out to the war on streets. Society wouldn't let them be. Not last century or the one before and not in 2018. A poet, a woman, mother, raised a boy, migrant teacher of language, went from campus to campus, plethora of words in her arsenal, Aquila and me, tokens. Brown female evolved spirit from the southwest or south side of any city. She was a teacher with dreads and a sleepy-eyed smile, believed must have in doing right, doing it strong for the sake of showing her son right from wrong. If you stayed steady, she said to herself, must have captain on a ship of two or ramen noodles or mac and cheese dinner, regular night bath, a story read, put the child to bed, braided papers till 2 a.m. then started again, must have like I had. The child you raised would benefit, fly like Obama had, success at his fingertips. No one would shoot him down in a good neighborhood. No policeman would kill him dead for reaching into a pocket. No school would hold him back till he gave up. Diabetes and other diseases would not, would be kept at bay. He'd be ready, your boy, your flesh, your son and mine, mijo, for the perpet for the perpetual onslaught. Then the time came for round one. Bell rung, fist up, Oluchi, graffiti can. The newly minted, the newly minted black man, Bell. Just like that. Just like that. When she got the call, rushed to MLK Hospital, put her ear next to his lips, bloated and bluish, parched like onion skin, having kissed their last kiss lips, swollen and soundless, felt no breath, heard no final, Mama, I love you. Her boy, left to perish on a gurney, her son, her flesh, she began to die too. Slow drip of existence oozed through her pores. Goodbye, love. Goodbye, 
far-reaching star, a round of green mint tea for the house before we move on, joy as she once knew it, vaporized. I felt it way across the land of the free and the brave, belonging to whites with money and no conscience. In a world, le monde, un mundo, where no education, knowledge of couplets, art or science, extent of good works, community service, le lectures attended or charitable donations would reset our heart broken by a child's ruin. I'll testify, not knowing each other, but by the way soldiers instantly bond, I heard her wail like a canine hears a dog whistle, ears up, heart pounding. We shared the vanity of affording good nutrition, books, clean water, and Little League. Nothing had saved them. Not we, Amazon mothers. Somehow, I'll say it, absent fathers failed them. One afternoon, standing in her living room, tired of beating without his, Akilah's heart stopped. She hit the rug heavy, sun filtering through bay windows, kept her lifeless body warm till they found her. The killing fields are everywhere, under the viaduct, over the freeway, Chicago, LA, Detroit, Denver, mothers, aunts, Little sis, abuelas with outlined lips and swaying hips, single mothers push grocery carts on the sidewalk, sneak out to dance, fuck in alleyways, hoping for love again, stretch meals through the week, have prepaid phone car cards, spend paychecks in advance, survive in the cracks. I taught him how to do shoelaces, his tie, ride a bike, later shave and drive a car, have pride and work, clean house, fry an egg, wash out his drawers, be respectful of women, neighbors, be an honorable friend. He was behind bars. I wrote, look at this poet, look at her life, her boy who went down at 21. Don't leave your mother with only the memory of a son. I'm going to share a short poem that I wrote. I have several poems here in Spanish, and, and um, I chose decades ago um, to write in English. I, I, I In my home, I, I was bilingual, and my mother taught me to write in Spanish when I was a, a child at home, so I could write to my grandmother in Mexico. So Spanish has always been an everyday part of my life, but I was raised before uh, during, well, I was a teen during the Civil Rights Movement in Chicago, and uh, I was raised as part of the generation that, that worked toward bilingual education and so on and so forth during a time where we were not permitted to speak Spanish in public or in school or in jobs and so on. Um, but, so when I started to write, uh, at 19 or decided it was a decision, I did sit down one day and say, I'm going to be a poet. I'm going to write. And, I chose to write in English because, not because I was trying to appeal to a monolingual audience, but because we were, in fact, only taught to read and, and write in English. Uh, the Chicanos and Mexicans and Latinos that I knew, uh, that's if we knew how to write at all, that's what we, we read and that's what we were able to, to write in. And so I wrote in English, and I'm a United States citizen, and so here I am writing in English, but. Spanish is a language that lives with me every day, and so I did include six uh, poems or seven poems in here in the, with, the, with the translation. And this is called, this is uh, uh, one of the many uh, awful scenes we are all hoping not to become a part of in this country, and it's called Gotas Caían en el Techo. Tick, tick, tick. Tick, 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 
una puñalada en el pecho del país y la noche no pestañaba ese San Valentín. Un tic, tic, tic caía en el techo y nadie dormía, ni yo, ni mi amor, ni el perro. Con las noticias del último masacre, 17 hijos perdieron sus vidas, alumnos, poetas, líderes del futuro fueron 17 almas esa vez. 17 cuéntanos en sus ataúdes que nunca llegaron a su madurez. 17 hijos e hijas cuenta si se puede las lágrimas de los padres y del pueblo. El terrorismo doméstico con tanta frecuencia en un lugar que se llama democracia. Ha hecho la muerte banal. Empezó hace siglos atrás hombres con armas odiosos de la humanidad, amantes del poder. Ahora se quitan la máscara, el disfraz, con la bendición del señor presidente. Tic, 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 caían las lágrimas del cielo. Nadie dormía, ni yo, ni mi amor, ni el perro. I wish you, thank you. Thank you all a very, a very wonderful and blessed and fruitful time together this week and in your writing. Remember you have to write from your heart, you have to write what's true to you. Worry about the commas and the and the grammar and punctuation way down the line later on. It'll come, it's important. We know the, the importance of a comma. For now, worry about what you have to say. Make sure you say it. Doesn't matter how you say it, it means you, except coming from you, somebody's going to hear it. And that's really our goal when we when we decide the writing is our lives. So I want to uh, thank you again. I don't know if you want to say anything else or if you want some questions. <laughs> Or I could read another poem. You you decide. Yeah. 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 I'll uh, I'll share with you this poem. As you see from this reading this evening, I'm not exactly the most cheerful of poets, and, <laughs> and I, I'm not. And you know, when I was very young and. You know, nobody ever saw a poet that looked like me, and I was a young woman, and I go to a party or a reception, and they would ask you, so what do you do? And I would say, well, I'm a poet. And they would say, I get romantica. <laughs> and uh, a few years ago, my alma mater in Chicago contacted me, uh, and they were inaugurating a new president, and they invited me to come and participate in the ceremony, they were very excited to, that, you know, it was the Af African American woman president. And they were very excited about my coming to read a poem, but as you can see, I didn't have anything appropriate <laughs> to read. Um, so I had to write something, and this is the poem that I read at the ceremony. It's called These Times. In these times, you and I share a mid air, you and I breathe, and opposition we meet. We take inspiration from day to day thriving. The sacred conch shell calls us, drums beat, prayer sends up, aromatic smoke of the pipe is our pledge to the gods. An all night fire vigil burns where we may consume the cactus messenger of the Huichol and of the Pueblo people of New Mexico. Red seeds of the plushed Calteca, mushrooms of Maria Sabina, tees de mi abuela from herbs grown in coffee cans on a Chicago back porch, tears of my mother on an assembly line in Lincolnwood, Illinois, aid us in calling upon memory in these times. In other days, when memory was as unshakable as the African continent, 
and long as a Quetzalcoatl's tail in the underworld, whipping against demons, drawing blood, potent as Quetliqua's two serpent face, and necklace of hearts and hands to remind us of our much required sacrifices for the sake of the whole. We did what we could to take memory like a belt chain around the waist to pull off to beat an enemy. But now, in these times of chaos and unprecedented greed, when disrupted elements are disregarded, Earth lashes back like the trickster Descatlipoca without forgiveness if we won't turn around, start again, say aloud, this was a mistake. We have done the Earth wrong, and we will make our planet a holy place again. I can. With my two hands, palpitating heart, we can and we will turn it around, if only we choose. In these times, all is not lost, nothing forever gone, though you may rightly think them a disgrace. Surely, hope has not abandoned our souls, even chance may be on our side. There are women and men, after all, young and not so young anymore, tired but tenacious mothers and fathers, teachers and those who heal and do not know that they are healers, and those who are learning for the sole purpose of returning what they know. Also among us are many who flounder and fall. They will be helped up by we who stumble forward. All of these and others must remember we will not be eradicated, degraded, and made irrelevant, not for a decade or even a day, not for 6,000 years have we been here, but millions. Look at me. I am alive and stand before you, unashamed despite endless provocations railed against an aging woman, my breasts withered from once giving suckle, and as of late, the hideousness of cancer, hair gone gray, and with the womb like a picked fig, left to dry in the sun. So, my worth is gone, they say. My value in the workplace also dwindled, as to the indispensable role of mother. As grandmother, I am not an asset in these times but am held against all that is new and fresh. Nevertheless, I stand before you. Dignity is my scepter. I did not make the mess we accept in this house. When the party is done, the last captive hung fair or unjustly, children saved and others lost, the last of men's wars declared, trade deals busted and others hardly begun, tyrants toppled, presidents deposed, police restrained or given full reign upon the public, and we don't know where to run on a day the sun rose and fell and the moon took its seat in the sky, I will have remained the woman who stayed behind to clean it up. so, so much, Dr. Cosio, for sharing your truth from the heart. It was such a gift to have you here this evening. 
And thank you, Dr. Alaman, for coming all the way from Albuquerque to do such a brilliant introduction. So, I, she, I counted the number of books over there. I think there's at least 15, and that's probably not even her entire body of work. Am I right? Yes. So please uh, help yourself support writers by looking at uh, Dr. Castillo's work and uh, purchase them. And we will also have some at Somos for the rest of the weekend as well. And I know this has been a long day for most of you, so thank you so much for coming. And I'll see some of you tomorrow.